Okay, um, I'm Stuart Walther. I've met a couple of you of my time here, but I'm going to talk about a uh, pretty common thing we see um, in fractal ophthalmology of CMB retinitis. But this patient that uh, I'm going to talk about in particular is a little more interesting because uh, in this age when a lot of patients are taking their antiretroviral medications, we don't see quite as uh, advanced pathologies or presentations. Normally we can sort of hold this uh, disease at bay, if you will. So um, we'll start off a long time ago in the beginning, um, back in June of 09, when this uh, gentleman was hospitalized um, for uh, disseminated histoplasmosis. And he had a positive CMV, PCR. Um, however, he, he uh, you know, you'll see this trend with the patient, but there's no, he reports no decrease in visual acuity. Um, but the general medicine doctors felt it was a good idea to have him referred over um, to us to take a look at him. Uh, and then when the initial exam was done, the positive, the point we want to look at the most is the guy had an altered null status and it made it pretty difficult to evaluate, at least subjectively, you know, what he's telling us. Um, visual acuity then receives uh, 2100, 2070. Uh, it was difficult and unreliable. Uh, the rest of his exam was fairly normal. Uh, and then we could see these uh, pigmentary changes, atrophic pigmentary changes, um, some retinal whitening located in the superior temporal region. His left eye was um, normal. So while he was still hospitalized, uh, he got two injections of uh, phosconet, and um, he was began on induction dose of uh, valcite. Um, during the hospitalization, he improved his uh, he was actually having seizures from histoplasmosis. His uh, clinical condition improved. And uh, when he was discharged, he was starting to follow with us uh, in about a week. So <coughs> when we first saw him uh, way back then, he's, uh, what do you expect? He had some blurry vision. Um, we have his history of uh, injections. But he was, uh, at this point in time, at least taking pretty much all the medications he should be taking for having HIV. So he was on a. Uh, He's a retroviral, th antiretroviral <coughs> therapy. He was taking a bunch of different antibiotics for prophylaxis. Uh, and his visual acuity, you know, is a lot better now. I don't know if this is because uh, some of it was the ability to obtain uh, correct answers when he was hospitalized, or if this is actual proof of the injections. Um, and the rest of it we see is just a pretty normal exam, except for he has these, he does have this deficit in that infranasal OD. Um, Slit lamp, he has a trace cell, anterior vitreous, and no other abnormal finding. So here's our picture we got from that date. Is that really dark up there? Okay, well, uh, at least we can see there's some whitening up here. Um, probably a little active lesion. There's uh, some, uh, you can see this like necrotic retina back here and this um, sort of scar. Yeah, that's really dark. Hopefully, some of the other pictures look a little better. Um, but if we could see this at all, his left eye is still pretty normal. Uh, so here's a little more of a close-up shot. This is still really dark. Um, but this is still, it's still an active eye, and he's going to receive a, another injection. This is sort of a mystery picture, I guess, with the uh, darkness. Uh, <laughs> okay, so he's got a lot of clinical visits now. He comes back. Um, his vision was stable in a one-week follow-up. And he did not receive injection. Then 10 days later, um, he's very blurry, um, no improvement. He's saying he has some floaters, and he's uh, actually reporting some pain, which is a pretty rare finding for CMB retinitis. Um, but we can see, at least here, he does have a decrease in visual acuity. And um, we'll look at these photos in a second. But uh, he went ahead and got another injection to try to hold back this disease. Um, a little dark, but so we can see that this area on the previous photo um, was actually a little more, there was a little more uh, of this white scar tissue um, and an active lesion. Uh, in this photo, I would think the next photo, we have a closer shot of this. It's the border is a little bit more defined, um, it's a little bit sharper edge. He's looking like he's improving a little bit, but still, we did see that decrease in vision, so it's concerning. Right, so here's our uh, close-up shot. We can see the um, white lesion here, the whitening of the retina, um, some necrotic retina, and then there's no hemorrhages in this one, which on the uh, 
second photo I showed you, there was originally. Loot. And uh, the OCT. Um, so we can at least see the color part down here. He's got a lot of um, swellings. It's really thick right here in the macula. And uh, he's got some cystic changes in here. Um, but he's still got sort of the normal curvature of the uh, macula. So considering his uh, the amount of swelling he's got going on, he's, his visual acuity is okay. <laughs> um, so we continue to follow him. His visual acuity improves here. Um, gets another steroid, he, or we're considering a steroid shot because of this uh, edema we saw, but with the HIV and you had a really low C and, uh, CD4 count, you're concerned about you know, giving someone steroids. Um, so then we check the, C the uh, CD4 count. Um, patient's supposed to come back in a couple more days. He does, we see that he's got a pretty drastic improvement in his vision here. Um, and then, you know, CD4 count's a little low uh, to be injecting steroids, but his, uh, his eye is starting to look pretty quiet. It looks like the medication and everything are actually doing a pretty good job of controlling this. And I apologize again for how uh, dark these pictures end up being, but um, compared to the uh, last close-up picture we saw in this area, you can see that there's even less um, active areas here. It's uh, more of like a uh, sort of some consolidated pigmentary changes and uh, white lesion made is just scar tissue formation now, which is sort of uh, what you find with an inactive form of CMV. Um, and then as we can see in the bottom, after this, our patient, instead of deciding to follow up, he just sort of disappeared. Um, so in the interlude between him showing back up in clinic, we'll talk a little bit about CMV. Uh, and for our basic science uh, fulfillment, we'll talk that it's a, it's a double-stranded DNA virus in the herpes family. Um, it, it replicates in lots of cells in the body, uh, particularly fibroblasts and epithelial cells and macrophages. And it's, um, you know, after the first act of infection, it remains latent in our body, like all herpes viruses, but uh, mostly in T cells, macrophages, and the bone marrow. Uh, and it's an uh, interesting disease in that when you're an adolescent, only about 14, 20% of the people have it. But as we uh, move on into our adulthood, between 50 and 85% of us have it by the age of 40. Uh, it's transmitted by pretty much any fluid coming out of our bodies. Um, and it can cause a really a broad spectrum of diseases. So uh, something we always remember is the uh, neonatal problems if you have an active CMV infection in a mother. Um, so you can get some ocular problems there, chorioretinitis, uh, central neural hearing loss. Um, really bad disease there. And as well, then what we normally hear about now is with uh, immunocompromised patients where it can cause anything from pneumonia to encephalitis uh, to colitis. And in our particular situation, we're going to talk about the retinitis. Uh, so it's most commonly, uh, it's the most common cause of a viral necrotizing retinitis in immunocompromised patients and HIV patients. If it's uh, untreated, it's going to progress to visual loss and blindness. Um, and if you're seeing this, the, it's almost a, a sign of their immune status. Um, if it's an active lesion, their CD4 count is uh, almost always less than 50. And, um, before the advent of our current retroviral therapies, it was sort of a telltale sign that this was the uh, end of your course with HIV AIDS. Um, you had a life expectancy about six weeks after diagnosis. So the important part for the people who are doing um, uh, our triage clinic right now and um, us as younger <coughs> students and residents is the symptoms. So these people, um, a lot of times you're just gonna have uh, maybe some um, scotoma or a decrease in vision. Uh, most commonly one eye as opposed to both. And uh, pain and photophobia are very common. So th the fact that he was having some pain in his eye was a little bit abnormal, but that uh, did decrease. Um, and often this infection is just asymptomatic and you know, someone's receiving good care, these findings can be found before there is uh, visual impairment. So in the physical exam, it's uh, like everything we do, it's important to uh, do a full exam, not just focus on the retina because you might find signs that lead you towards uh, other diagnoses like uh, a lymphoma or Kaposi's. Um, so what you're gonna see is a, a hopefully a quiet eye. Um, in the uh, cornea, you can find some stellate uh, keratinic precipitates. Um, also there's a 
rare times that you'll see a uveitis with this. Um, and then we'll talk, you know, just sort of about the different forms that can have different appearances. So um, this indolent form, the slowest form, this is this granular opacities uh, with satellite lesions and occasional hemorrhages. And I think that's sort of what we were seeing in the um, about the third photo after he'd been receiving some treatment where there was these um, granular changes, but it wasn't just this full-on fulminant disease like we'll see later. Um, then this fulminant form, we have a great way of remembering it. it's a cheese pizza type appearance, the retina. Uh, you get these large areas of uh, necrotic retina and white fluffy infiltrates scattered with um, hemorrhages around the vasculature. Um, and it's important to think that this is something that can progress very rapidly, so we always want to follow it quickly. Um, and after, if you successfully treat this, your resolution, you're going to look for just this uh, RPE atrophy and pigmentary clumping. So let's sort of look at a couple of these. Uh, well, let's further go into the stage of this. So like I said, there's a, the active lesions, which is hemorrhagic, um, large areas of hemorrhage, uh, background white and retina. And then there's a brush fire variant, um, which if you, I guess if you've seen, maybe if you watch the California wildfires on something in the news, it makes it a little easier to visualize. But you'll see a, uh, like a yellow white margin that's moving uh, from the periphery normally towards the center. Uh, and behind it is a um, sort of burnt out um, atrophic retina. Um, and then the granular form, which is these uh, small white lesions um, with pigment changes. Um, in the necrotic stage, right, it's the end result. So the zones of involvement are important when we're um, thinking about how threatening this is. So if it's in zone one, which is 1,500 micrometers um, from the disc, or about 3,000 micrometers from the fovea, this is uh, something that's immediately visually threatening. Um, we definitely want to start treating this patient you know, with a very close supervision. And then zone two and three, uh, zone two is from the border of zone one out to the uh, equator, basically. Um, not immediately visual threatening. Uh, and then zone three, zone three is uh, uh, from this uh, sort of imaginary circle connecting the ampulla vortex veins to the uh, aura. Um, so this is sort of our all the semantics classification orders. So here we have our actual pictures. Uh, these are a little bit, a little bit uh, easier to see. But here's sort of the edge of this brush fire um, where the active disease is moving, and uh, behind it we can see there's the sort of burnt out atrophic retina. Uh, the hemorrhagic one, I, I think it takes a little bit of imagination to see the cheese pizza, but uh, you see these large white active lesions and then um, hemorrhages all interspersed along the uh, blood vessel. And then the granular appearance, um, is, yeah, you can still see there's some fine little uh, granular looking uh, changes here and some uh, pigment clumping um, in the white, but the white uh, active areas are sort of scarred down. So um, we look at a differential of this. First off, you know, if, if you have CMV retinitis, you always have to think about the uh, underlying causes like a, a HIV AIDS patient, leukemia, lymphoma, um, if you are on drugs or something causing aplastic anemia uh, or any other immunosuppressive chemotherapy uh, is also in there. But then there's this other sort of spectrum of diseases that could mimic this. Um, so acute retinal necrosis, which is also caused by herpes family viruses. Um, you can just have an HIV um, retinopathy. Syphilis can look sort of similar, as well as toxo, uh, histo, tuberculosis, and uh, progressive outer retinal necrosis. Um, so to work up the patient fully, we got to make sure we look at his uh, CD4 count, do a, a CMV, PCR. Um, and then, you know, this is sort of a newer idea, but if you uh, have someone who has an abnormal looking disease or you're struggling to figure it out, you can uh, uh, take a vitreous sample and PCR that as well, which has a really high specificity um, you know, sensitivity for diagnosing this. Um, and then you just want to do some other baseline exams. Uh, the BU and creatinine to monitor for uh, potential changes in this, uh, kidney function when you're treating a disease. Uh, and then it's uh, toxo. Um, your test for syphilis to be thorough, at least for ruling out some of our other causes. And um, in rare cases, you can get a, a vitreitis, uh, which obscures the views of the back of the retina, which in case uh, the ultrasound will be helpful, uh, as well as you can uh, 
or a chest x-ray in looking for a concomitant PCP. So our goal is to uh, stop the precocious disease. Um, and something that's been of uh, a little bit of debate is the discontinuation of treatment of it. But um, basically, whenever this, uh, whenever we see a CMV retinitis, the preferred me method of treatment these days is uh, an induction dose of a uh, valcite um, twice daily for three weeks, and then you can uh, bring it down to a maintenance dose, of only a nine milligram once daily. Um, and side effects of this, it's, it does uh, cause issues for. Um, you know, blood cell production, so you can get a bromocytopenia or a neutropenia. So, with the advent of uh, Neupogen, uh, we can continue treatment um, while at least avoiding some complications, having a low neutrophil count. Uh, but the main treatment uh, now that's really changing things is using these uh, intramitrial injections, um, which allows us to get a high dose drug um, sort of right in the center of the action. Um, but the downfall is it lasts for a short period. Um, so there's also intravitreal implants, which uh, have a long-term uh, effect. So our patient, after a year, manages to uh, come back to us. Um, his vision is now 2600 in his right eye, and uh, we're seeing some changes in his left eye as well, 2030. And then when they do the visual fields, you can see he's got a uh, field defect here. Um, an inferior side, uh, left eye on both sides, and he has uh, almost um, complete uh, uh, hemisphere loss of vision there. And his pressure's a little elevated in his uh, left eye. Uh, so it's sort of scary to think what might be back there. And in fact, when we take a look, um, this is a, a very large active lesion. There's a lot of uh, scarring. There's an active uh, sort of fluffy lesion here. I, um, let's see, I can't, I don't know if you can see this, but it looks like there might be, be some, some traction back here, um, but it, it's sort of inclusive right now. And then on the, uh, the closer view of, of this lesion, is what we're seeing over here, if it's at all possible to make it out. Um, you can see the fluffy lesion, uh, there's this scar ring. Um, and then in his left eye, what was a, a great eye, um, we now have a, you can at least make out this is a very blurry picture, which is uh, believed to have a, you know, a vitreitis. Um, and then we can see in the, more in the periphery, he has a, an active lesion here, necrotic retina, and a, a more nasally, uh, he actually had some hemorrhage as well. So we restarted him on the therapy like we talked about in our methods of treating this. Um, he was received uh, OU injections of Foscarnet and was started on uh, Valcite. Um, and was instructed to pretty much follow up the next day in clinic, follow up week in clinic. And we started to see s a visual improvement. Um, and then we you know, managed to get records of where this guy's been for the last year. So the whole reason this has happened is we'd imagine is he's been off his meds. And uh, when he stopped his meds, he was hospitalized. Um, he had another case of histoplasmosis meningitis. Uh, then he had CMV colitis. Um, but at least currently, he's following up with his ID doctor and uh, reporting to clinic. So the important point to take away from this, at least, is that uh, most patients with CMV retinitis presents uh, unilater unilaterally, but um, as they manage to avoid their treatment or mistreatments, um, they have a 50% risk of developing disease in the contralateral eye uh, within six months. But uh, this has pretty much been reduced a lot in our time period by um, antiretroviral treatment and uh, heart. Uh, something else to look for in these patients is that there's potential for uh, retinal attachment in up to a third of these patients. Um, and you have an increased chance of RD when you have a large portion of the retina involved. So in the right eye of this patient where you, you know a large, large portion of the retina is involved, there's a high risk for uh, RD, at least um, in the, especially in areas of necrosis. And then a, another sort of newer area um, is that you can have a, a uveitis as reaction to these patients when their immune system recovers. Um, so this guy, when he's now reinitiating his uh, retroviral therapy and he's going to have a rise in his CD4 count. Um, he can actually
actually have a flare up of the uveitis um, from some of these uh, viral infected cells that can lead to other complications um, like cataracts, glaucoma. Uh, you can get uh, epiretinal membranes, and uh, you can even have visual loss from this, uh, most commonly with uh, crystalloid macular edema. Um, so it's a pretty broad overview of CMB retinitis, and maybe it was uh, <laughs> at least reminded some of us of some key points with, with my references. Uh, any questions? And uh, this is sort of, uh, you know, there's a lot of rambling in all our presentations, but this is the sort of take home point that I found that might be helpful for uh, us as younger students or when we're on call that um, sort of pull apart some of these uh, different diseases. So uh, with CMV, you can see that pain is pretty rare. Um, and if the patient has a history of being immunocompromised, that might sort of lead you towards that diagnosis as opposed to. Uh, ARN where you're going to have significant pain uh, as well if you saw like more of a hazy picture um, and then you can see more of a sharply demarcated lesion or toxo where uh, it sort of <laughs> can fit into uh, any of these categories but the important part here would be that uh, you're never going to see a, a retinal hemorrhage um, and then this typical headlight and fog appearance so if you can remember one thing <laughs> at least for us younger guys I think that's uh, something to sort of put in your mind for the rest of the day. I didn't see much about that. I, uh, there's a lot of forms of <laughs> CMB and a lot of different presentations. I think there's the frosted branch meningitis, I know. It's something that's in textbooks and in papers, but um, it seemed to be a very pretty low occurrence. So <laughs> I don't want to say this is an inclusive talk. Are there any key points to add about it?